Do you want to apply machine learning to challenging, worthwhile global problems? How about one of science and engineering's biggest challenges, nuclear fusion? So hi everyone, welcome back, or if you're new here, welcome to DigiLab. My name is Sid Cowley, I am a doctor in plasma physics for nuclear fusion and a fusion solutions engineer here at DigiLab. And in this series, we're going to be going through an application of machine learning, but not just any application. We're gonna be looking at one of the largest science and engineering projects ever undertaken by humans, the quest to harness the power of the stars and use it for the benefit of mankind nuclear fusion. In this first episode, I'm going to give you an overview of the course as well as an introduction to fusion. So by the end of the episode, you should be able to understand what fusion is, why we're researching it, and why it's a great application for machine learning. Now, if you've been following either nuclear fusion or machine learning, you'll know they can sometimes be presented as these magical, mystical technologies. So in this series, I'll be taking you through a no-nonsense, straightforward overview of machine learning applied to nuclear fusion. And throughout the series, we'll have some great input from experts in different areas in the field. So let's get right into it. Now, because at DigiLab, we're a machine learning company, we have loads of other videos on introductions to machine learning and different machine learning techniques, which I recommend you check out if you're new to the field. But just as a quick reminder, I'm defining machine learning as the use of computer algorithms and statistics to learn and predict patterns in data. This could be anything from a simple linear regression to a Gaussian process to a neural network. Now, there are many applications of machine learning applied right now in society, but a lot of them are quite down to earth, whether it be things like trying to get you to buy more products with specialized ads or detecting whether an email should be sent to spam. But in this series, we'll be focusing on an inherently difficult, technical, scientific and engineering challenge, and that's nuclear fusion. But what is fusion? Well, fusion is the process that powers the sun and every other active star in the sky. It involves two small nuclei, which are the positively charged objects at the center of every atom. In a fusion reaction, these two nuclei overcome the intense electrostatic repulsion trying to push them apart and smash together to form one large nucleus. When two nuclei like hydrogen fuse, part of the energy that binds the subatomic particles of the nucleus together gets released. And it's the release of this nuclear binding energy that powers the sun and is what could power our society if we could get controlled fusion working here on Earth. And that really is an incredible prospect, controlled fusion on Earth, because the only product of hydrogenic fusion is helium and neutrons. No CO2 is produced or other greenhouse gases. What's more, getting two hydrogen nuclei to fuse together to form helium is an incredibly energy dense process and uses the most abundant element in the universe as fuel. And unlike fission, fusion reactions themselves don't produce long-lived radioactive nuclei. Now, this doesn't mean fusion doesn't produce any radioactive waste, which I will talk about in a later episode. Overall, it should be clear that nuclear fusion represents a safe, clean, potentially inexhaustible supply of energy. So it really could be transformative for the energy sector. The only downside is that Believe it or not, it's incredibly hard to do. Well, incredibly hard here on Earth anyway. And that's because of the intense electric repulsion forces I mentioned earlier, keeping the nuclei away and making the chances of a successful fusion collision very low. So low, in fact, that in the room you're standing in, there's probably trillions upon trillions upon trillions of collisions between gas particles every second. That's around 10 to the 36 collisions. And a successful fusion reaction doesn't happen from a single one. So why is it that the Earth and the room you're standing in is so bad at making fusion reactions happen? And what's the sun's secret to generating so much fusion energy? Well, as you may have guessed, the sun is slightly hotter than the room you're in, or at least I think it should be. Roughly 15 million degrees hotter, in fact. And that really is the key to fusion. Because when we make material hot, what we're really doing is giving the particles inside that material kinetic energy so that they bounce around more and they bounce around faster. 
If we give the particles enough energy, they can overcome that repulsive force and successfully collide and fuse. So how much energy is enough? Well, we can answer that question and some other ones with this figure here, a very important figure for fusion. It shows what's called the reactivity, which is essentially the likelihood of a successful fusion reaction as a function of temperature on the x-axis of the fuel. And it shows this for a load of different candidate fuels that we could use for fusion, things like deuterium and tritium or protons and boron. And firstly, one important thing you can see from this figure is that the fuel mixture with the absolute highest reactivity or the highest chances of successful fusion reaction is this here, deuterium tritium or DT, two isotopes of hydrogen. This essentially means they're forms of hydrogen with a different number of neutrons in the nucleus. What we can also see is that the peak in reactivity for DT is at a relatively modest temperature. And because of this, because of the high reactivity and relatively modest temperature we need, deuterium tritium fusion is the most common fuel source used in fusion projects. So DT seems great in terms of achieving easy fusion, but there are a few downsides to using DT. First of all, deuterium tritium fusion reactions produce a great deal of high energy neutrons, which can cause radiation damage to surrounding material. Secondly, though deuterium is naturally occurring and is quite abundant in things like seawater, tritium is not naturally occurring and is a radioactive isotope of hydrogen, meaning it needs to be handled carefully and because it's not naturally occurring, any successful fusion power plant that operates with DT needs to make its own self-sufficient source of tritium. That's going to be an important topic which we'll cover later. Crucially, coming back to the figure, it tells us another important thing about fusion. And that's the fact that if we want to operate with DT fusion and we want the highest reactivities or highest chances of a successful fusion reaction, we need to get the fuel to around 10 keV or above the 10 keV range. This corresponds to roughly 150 million degrees. Yeah, you heard that right. Not a hundred, not a thousand, not a million, 150 million degrees. If you remember, I said earlier, the sun is 15 million degrees. That means if we want a successful DT fusion device on Earth, we need to get the fuel to 10 times hotter temperatures than the core of the sun. When we heat material up to these kind of temperatures, it becomes a plasma a material where the electrons, the negatively charged electrons and the positively charged nuclei start to separate, leaving this sort of soup of charged particles moving around all over the place. Getting the fuel to this temperature is really the central challenge of fusion. And it's not just about how we heat our material, but about something called confinement. But what is confinement? Well, let me explain by asking you, could we heat up a bit of hydrogen to 150 million degrees on, let's say, my gas stove. Now, I assume most of you would correctly say, no, I don't think so, but why? Well, even if we continuously add heat to a material, it won't keep getting hotter. And that's because materials tend to lose heat to its surrounding environment. And typically the hotter a material is, the more energy it will lose. So really, we need to find ways of making sure that the heat we add to a fuel stays in the fuel. And this is the fundamental challenge of fusion, which we call confinement. And for years, we've been working on this central challenge of confinement. There are dozens of fusion experiments spread across the globe, trying to achieve the hottest, densest plasmas possible with the least amount of losses by confining the plasma using a number of methods. And these methods broadly fall under three different categories, magnetic fusion, inertial fusion, and magneto-inertial fusion. In magnetic confinement fusion, or MCF, we use strong magnetic fields to make sure that particles travel on these twisted paths and don't escape the hot, dense core of the plasma. The majority of MCF research is into these donut-shaped devices with two sets of magnetic field coils to generate those twisty paths, and this device is known as a tokamak. But there's also a lot of research into machines known as stellarators, where to get the particles traveling on these twisted magnetic field lines, 
Rather than using two sets of normal coils like a tokamak, a stellarator uses one set of twisted magnetic field coils. In inertial confinement fusion, or ICF, small capsules of fusion fuel are compressed to really high densities and temperatures in very short timescales, typically by using some sort of inward-driven shock. This can be done by ablating the outer layer of a fusion fuel capsule, as is done in laser fusion, or by smacking the fuel capsule with a high-velocity projectile, as is done in projectile fusion. Finally, magneto-inertial fusion is some combination of the two approaches, this rapid compression and the magnetic fields. Now, as I said, there are dozens of experimental machines spread across the globe looking into various aspects of fusion science and engineering and leveraging different confinement methods. But even though they have different methods, all fusion power plants of the future will have some things in common. For example, all the power plants will need some sort of burning fusion plasma at their core. But surrounding this, they'll also need some sort of plasma facing material, which needs to be very strong and resistant to the high heat loads that they'll receive from the burning fusion plasma. Surrounding this will be the cooling systems, which draw those heat loads away from the plasma facing material and towards the heat exchanging and conversion systems to generate electricity. And for DT fusion, or deuterium-tritium fusion, we're going to need some sort of breeding system, which catches the neutrons produced by the fusion reactions and uses those to make the self-sustaining supply of tritium that, remember if I said before, this process really needs. Finally, any fusion power plant will need diagnostics, which constantly monitor the plasma and different components in the machine. And in conjunction with these diagnostics, there'll need to be control systems, which decide how much fuel to inject into the plasma, how much heat to inject, how much current to put through your magnetic coils, for example, and so on and so on. Future machines will also need robotic systems to maintain parts of the plant that can't be accessed by humans due to, for example, radiation doses. Now, all these requirements and systems build up to mean that a tokamak looks less like this and more like this. And a laser fusion power plant looks less like this and more like this. These are really not the simplest of machines, but who's surprised? Even though we've got a lot of active experiments all across the globe studying fusion plasmas, we still haven't got demonstration devices that show a net production of energy with fusion. But that's what the next generation of devices hope to prove. And there's a lot of companies and organizations constructing and designing those reactor-like devices today. But these next generation reactor-like fusion devices are quite a big step away from the experiments we have today. So as we go forth into this uncertain, unknown future, prediction is going to be more important than ever. Whether it be predicting the behavior of a liquid lithium breeder blanket or making sure we understand how to adjust and control a burning fusion plasma, data science and prediction is going to be pivotal for the future of fusion. And this is where machine learning fits in. At every level of development for fusion, there's opportunities to leverage the predictive power of machine learning and advanced computational techniques so that we can push fusion that one step closer to reality. And through this series, we're going to explore just that. It's going to be an overview of the various different ways that machine learning is currently being applied to fusion and the opportunities that we have in the future. We'll start by looking at how machine learning can aid more fundamental understanding of the science and engineering problems. And that could be modeling how turbulence in magnetic fusion devices impacts your confinement and your fusion performance. Then we'll look at how you can apply machine learning to aid the development of fusion experiments. Things like developing better analysis tools for diagnostics or more advanced techniques for plasma control. Finally, we'll take a step back and look at the big picture, investigating how we can connect up what we've learned from different theories, models, and experiments. Exploring things like using large language models to make access to fusion data easier or developing surrogate models and uncertainty quantification methods for integrated systems or constructing digital twins. So we've got a lot of really exciting stuff ahead. I really hope you can join me on this journey into 
what I think is the intersection of two of the most advanced and exciting fields in science today. But I have to say for today, that's all. I really hope you enjoyed this brief introduction into fusion and machine learning. And don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so that you can stay updated on all things machine learning. In the next episode, we'll go through quite a simple but powerful way that machine learning can be applied to fusion. I'll see you then.